Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Six Pack Warriors. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, episode 191. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to the regulation and uniform code of military justice. So help me God. Did you know that God refers to us as an old pot? You'll discover why in this episode. I try never to do this, but the Biden economy has this apostolate against the ropes. Virtually everything used to keep this apostolate in business is crushing me. Up to now, when the apostolate hasn't generated enough revenue to cover expenses, I paid for it out of pocket. That's no longer an option because our personal income is only about $2,000 per month and we're being crushed. I realize that this economy is hurting you too, but most of you have more disposable income than we do. I need your help because we're having to choose which essentials we can afford on a month-by-month basis. There are two ways you can help. In the show notes of each episode at cantankerouscatholic.com, there are a list of links under headings Earn Money Online, Courses and Tools, Health and Wellness, Trading and Investing, Podcasting, and Miscellaneous. These links are to products and services that may interest you, and I get a commission if you purchase them. As always, I won't recommend anything I believe is shady, and to the best of my knowledge, you can trust these links. The other way you can help is by clicking on the link that says help keep the Joe Six Pack the Every Catholic Guy Apostolate alive. You can make a one-time gift, but you'll also have the option of making yours a monthly gift. Please make it a monthly gift if you can. Food shortages are already becoming apparent, and rolling blackouts are coming soon. 
We're elderly and ill. We need help. And I thank you in advance for your generosity. To begin this episode, I want to tell you that it's being published on August 10th, which is the feast day of my baptismal patron, St. Lawrence the Archdeacon. I chose St. Lawrence as my patron because of his courage and his sense of humor, hoping he'd give me that same courage and sense of humor. I urge you all to look him up. His story won't be more than a few paragraphs because he died in A.D. 258. In the last several episodes, I've given Archbishop Fulton Sheen a lot of exposure. I mentioned him in the main topic at least three times, at least once in the last few Catholic boot camps, and the last three Catholic quotes have been things by the Venerable Archbishop. As I remember, even Simon Rafe mentioned him last week in the interview. This past week, it occurred to me that an entire generation, and at least part of another generation, have never really been exposed to Archbishop Sheen. Some of you maybe hadn't even heard of him at all until he was given mention on this show. I'm pretty certain, though, that the vast majority of you have heard of him. Likewise, I think that the vast majority of you have never heard him. That's sad, too, because if ever there was a wise prelate whose wisdom we need today, it's Archbishop Sheen. In the golden age of television in the 1950s, the TV industry will tell you that comedian Milton Berle was the king of the era. He was known as both Mr. Television and Uncle Milty. The TV industry will also tell you that he had the highest rated show in television history. But that's not quite true. Running opposite Milton Berle's time slot on a different network, there was a show called Life is Worth Living. It starred none other than the venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. Sheen's show actually outrated Milton Berle's comedy hour at one point. In fact, so many non-Catholic people watched the show that Sheen became known as America's Bishop. That's a pretty big accomplishment, too, especially in an era when anti-Catholic bigotry was at an extremely high point in this country. Sheen was both a prophet and visionary for the future, and he was a Renaissance man. He was a Renaissance man in that he embodied all that was good and holy in the Catholic Church's 2,000-year tradition, and he was a prophet and visionary because during the last decade of his life, he spoke a great deal about this particular era in America and in church history. He foresaw all of it, and he prophetically told us that if the church in America could be saved, it would be saved by we laity. Frankly, I think it's a downright injustice that most of you haven't ever had the opportunity to hear Archbishop Sheen. If you haven't had a healthy diet of Sheen, then your formation as a practicing Catholic is woefully lacking. Therefore, even though I had other things planned for my production schedule, I decided to give you the exposure you deserve to a man who I believe is the greatest contemporary saint we have. There are literally hundreds of Sheen's recorded talks. I've heard every one of them. Do I have a favorite? No, not at all. I like all of them. I admit that I like some more than others, but they're all too good to have a favorite. So I've decided to play one of his many talks I like so well. Sheen titled it Old Pots. I think you'll really like it. Let's listen. You good people are at a distinct disadvantage in coming to hear me. First of all, I have no papers, and therefore you never know when I'm going to finish. (laughs) You could say, oh, he has only three more inches to go. (laughs) One of the reasons I never use a paper is because I once heard a woman speaking of a sermon of a bishop. She said, glory be to God, after he had read his talk. If he can't remember it, how does he expect us to? (laughs) You're going to hear a subject today that you've never heard before. I'm going to talk about pots, old pots. 
Have you ever called any person a pot? Sure you have. Do you know that God calls us pots too? That will be the sermon, pots. And I will begin it with a text from St. Paul. It is from his letter to the Corinthians. I heard a reader the other day read the epistle to the Filipinos. <laughs> instead of the Philippians. And another who read the second letter to the theologians. We are no better than pots of earthenware to contain this great treasure. And this proves that such transcendent power does not come from us, but is God's alone. Notice that we have a treasure inside of us, which is grace. Christ's life is in our body. But the body is a pot, like a pot of earthenware. Never before has anyone put, put such a treasure in so trivial a deposit. God doesn't change the nature of our pots. When he makes us his children, for example, Moses was called to be the leader of Israel and Moses stuttered. Three times God said to Moses, or Moses said to God, I can't talk, I stutter. And God said to him, well, let your brother Aaron talk for you then. But he would not remove the stuttering. That was the nature of his pot. Peter was impetuous, always impetuous. Thomas was lugubrious and sad, always looking for rain on the day of the picnic. God did not change his nature. Paul was a man of fire, rather intolerant. The treasure was put into that pot. And then, if we're ugly, God leaves us ugly. St. Vincent de Paul was a very ugly man, but he contained a great treasure. So let me take you through scripture and describe God's way of dealing with pots. First of all, where does the treasure come from? Well, the treasure comes from God. And here we go back to the marriage feast of Cana. Our blessed Lord attended this wedding, and there were six water pots, and there were large ones containing 20 or 30 gallons of water. Now this gives you some idea of how much wine our blessed Lord made, 120 or 180 gallons of wine. Now the water pots were used by the Jews for purification. They had a peculiar kind of washing. They had to wash their, their uh, hands in such a manner as to let the water drip down their fingers. Then they would rub the palms together. And some of these practices were so bound up legally that to break them was considered very serious. Now here we are just before our conversion. We're like these six water pots or before our baptism. And our blessed Lord changes the water into wine. He still keeps the same pot. The steward said they have no wine. Why didn't they have any wine? Why did it all give out? Can you imagine wine giving out in a wine country? And certainly, any father would prepare adequate wine for a wedding ceremony. Why did it give out? Because our blessed Lord brought along all of his disciples. 
They liked wine then. It was the first case of gate crashing in the history of Christianity. So our blessed Lord leaves the water pots as they are, but changes the water into wine. As the poet Crashaw put it so beautifully, the unconscious waters saw their God and blushed. One would like to write a line of poetry of that kind and die. When God changes our nature, it's very much like, for example, if this marble suddenly began to bloom. That would be something that does not belong to the nature of marble. It would be a supernatural act for marble. If the flowers on the altar of Our Lady suddenly began to walk around the room, that would be a supernatural act for a flower. And if a dog began to quote Shakespeare, that would be something that does not belong to his nature. And if we, who are just creatures of God, just pots, are suddenly endowed with a treasure so that we participate of God's nature as we participate of the nature of our parents, then that's a supernatural act for us. So when, therefore, does the pot get this treasure? It gets it at the moment that the soul receives grace. Now, how much grace and how much treasure do we receive? That depends upon our emptiness. If a box is filled with salt, it can't be filled with pepper. If I am filled with a love of self, I cannot be filled with Christ. Therefore, all spirituality is dependent upon eccentration, getting rid of the ego. Not so much using the word I. Here I take you to another incident of pots. There was a poor old woman in the Old Testament who had two sons who were about to be sold as creditors because she could not pay her debts. And Elisha the prophet came and asked her what she had. She said, all I have is this small pot of oil. Well, Elisha said, send out your sons to the neighborhood. and Bring in all of the pots that you can find. Then Elisha said to the woman, now begin to pour the oil. Well, the woman began to pour the oil, and it didn't stop. And it filled one vessel, one pot, then another pot, and another. And finally she said to her son, hurry, another pot. And, and uh, the son says, there is no other pot. And it stopped. So God pours his grace into us according to our emptiness. And I will tell you later what helps to create that emptiness. This is one of the reasons why some people, for example, do not receive an increase of grace, why we're not saints. We have too much of the ego, the I in us. So then we get our grace, our treasure, from God, as exemplified by Cana. We must be empty. And then another condition is that sometimes God will put us through trials. And he will do that just in order to bring us closer to him. Now we sometimes think we should never have trials. As a matter of fact, this is part of Christianity. Remember that Christianity began with a defeat. The victory came only at the end. The defeat began with the cross. Our blessed Lord, therefore, sends us trials. Now, here's an example of trial. I will read for you a passage from Jeremiah. And this passage is not just alone about the pot and the treasure. 
but it is rather about trials that come to different pots. I will first read Jeremiah, and then I will I will um, explain it to you. And I'm always reading from the uh, New English Bible. In Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 11, all his life long, Moab has lain undisturbed like wine settled on its lees. Not emptied from vessel to vessel, he has not gone into exile. Therefore the taste of him is unaltered and the flavor stays unchanged. What is behind this prophecy of Jeremiah is the description of how wine was made in those days. Grape juice was poured into a vessel. The grape juice settled. The dregs or the lees went to the bottom. The winemaker would then pour the wine into another vessel or pot, leave the dregs in the first vessel. Then he would do it the third, fourth, and fifth time, always leaving the dregs behind. Now God is speaking to Moab, the people of Moab. They were the enemies of the Jews. They would not allow the Israelites, for example, to cross through their land. Is that a signal for me to quit that bell? No? I never know. They wouldn't, for example, allow the Israelites to cross through their land. Now God is saying, Moab, you people have never had any trial or tribulation. You've never gone into exile like the Jews. And because you've never gone into exile, your wine is unfermented, it's stale, it's sour. Here the scripture indicates that we sometimes will be shifted and our positions will be changed. We may have a checkered career. We may have blessings for a time and then we'll have adversities. All this is to make the more perfect wine. God does not like us to settle down. Because when we do our pot becomes full of dregs and leaves. And that brings me to another story about pots. Now suppose I tell you there were 87 examples in scripture. What would you do? Two hours and a half at least it would take. But it's not going to take that long. The next one is also from Jeremiah. And this is a very beautiful one. I love to read this passage. It is um, chapter 18, verse 1. God speaks to this great prophet, Jeremiah. And these are the words that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down at once to the potter's house, and there I will tell you what I have to say. So I went down to the potter's house and found him working at the wheel. Now and then a vessel he was making out of the clay would be spoiled in his hands. And then he would start again and mold it into another vessel to his liking. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Can I not deal with you, Israel, says the Lord, as the potter deals with clay? You are clay in my hands, like clay in his house of Israel. Now let me explain this. Jeremiah is told to go down to the potter's house. 
There he found a man at a wheel with clay at a table nearby. The potter has the intent of making a very fine vase. If it's expensive, it's a vase. If it's cheap, it's a vase. He has the intention of making, say, a main vase. And as he plies his finger over the wheel and the clay on it, it breaks and it falls to the ground. Does he leave the clay there? No. He picks it up and he said, well, if I can't make a vase, I shall make a vase. And so he makes it into an old pot. Now, God has the intention to make each and every one of us a vase. But we all do not turn out the way he wants us to be. And the way that we very often want to be. Does God reject us? No, he doesn't. He puts us again on the wheel and turns and he makes us into a lesser vessel. But we are still his. Never despair, therefore, because there has been a failure. God does not let you go. The Father continues to work with you and to turn you into, even though it is a common vessel, one that can still contain the treasure of his grace. And we are very often, when tribulations and trial come, we are to see that we're clay in the hands of the potter. And God is molding us. On the last day, we'll be very grateful, too, that God did take his time in making us better. George Bernard Shaw said, it is too bad that youth was wasted on the young. No, I think it's a good thing that youth was wasted on the young. Because when we get older, we get a little wiser. And God has a better opportunity sometimes of working with his pots. Now we come to the last of the analogies of the pot. This is the story of the woman at the well. The time is high noon. The land is Samaria. Now Samaria was the ham in a sandwich. The Holy Land was divided into two parts, Judea and Galilee. Judea was on the right side of the tracks. Galilee was on the wrong side of the tracks. When the Babylonians, six centuries before Christ, took over this land, they brought in some of their own people who intermarried with the Jews. And they produced a hybrid race called the Samaritans. Now, the Jews would never have anything to do with the Samaritans. As a matter of fact, they would not accept any money for the building of the temple from the Samaritans. Now, I can't give you a better idea than that of how much they must have hated the Samaritans. And the Samaritans, in their turn, when the Jews were in captivity, they would telegraph the dates of the feast by lighting fires on mountaintops. Samaritans would always light the fires two or three days in advance to confuse the Jews. The Samaritans would throw bones into the temple to desecrate it. So our blessed Lord now comes to this well at high noon, sits down tired, tired. And a woman comes to draw water. Now she should not have been there at noon. 
No woman in a hot country ever comes at high noon to draw water from a well. There was a reason for it. And our blessed Lord says to her, Will you give me to drink? Whenever our Lord wants a favor, he often asks for one. And she said, This well is deep, and you have no pot wherewith to draw. And how is it that you, a Jew, speak to me, a Samaritan? Our Lord said, if you knew who it was who asked you for a drink, you would ask him for the fountain of living water. Our Lord was here describing grace. He was saying, under the analogy of water, that I will give you a kind of an inner spring, a fountain of truth and love. But she couldn't understand that. And our blessed Lord saw that she could not. And he said to her, go tell your husband. She said, I have no husband. Our Lord said, thou answerest well, thou hast no husband, for thou hast five. And he with whom thou livest now is not thy husband. Now that was embarrassing. Now you know why she couldn't come in the morning at night. The women wouldn't let her come. She was an evil woman. You had to come alone at noon. Now that was rather disturbing to the Samaritan woman for a Jew to tell her that. How did he know anyway? Now what would you do if you were at that well and you were in that condition? I know what I would do. I would change the subject. <laughs> Who, what woman, for example, with, with six men wants to talk to a one like our blessed Lord about adultery? So she changed the subject too. She said, let's talk about theology. Where should we worship? In Jerusalem or do the Jews or on the mountaintop as we Samaritans do? And our Lord said, neither. And he explained about the true worship of the Father. Well, she came to understand him and to know him better. It's interesting the different titles that she gave him in the course of that conversation. First, she called him a Jew. Then she saw that he was a gentleman. She addressed him as sir. Then prophet, then Messiah, the expected one, the Christ. And when our Lord said to her, when she said, I, I know that Christ is coming, our Lord said, it is I who talks with you. Well, think of what a surprise that was. What does she do? She runs back to the Samaritan village. Incidentally, there are only about 150 Samaritans left in the world, pure Samaritans. She runs back to the Samaritan village, and the gospel says she leaves her pot behind. No more need of it. She had waters now. And then she tells the people, and there is some indication in some of the gospel accounts, that maybe she told only the men she was going to get even with the women <laughs> because they wouldn't let her come out in morning or night. But can't you imagine this woman coming out again to the well with a lot of men flocking after her, all of her boyfriends? And, and they said to her, we believe now, but not because you told us, because we've seen with our own eyes. And the woman called our Lord for the first time in the hearing of the world, 
Savior. Jew, gentleman, prophet, Messiah, Savior of the world. And applying the lesson now of Potts, we have a treasure within us, God's presence, God's grace. It is perfected by trial, by adversities born in his name. But there will come a moment when we'll meet the Lord, as the woman did, and we'll leave the old pot behind. and is put into the grave. But the treasure, the treasure goes to the Lord. And the spirit that goes to the Lord always retains affinity for that body. Because that old pot had something to do with the bearing of trials. It brought us to the communion rail. It united ourselves with the body and blood of Christ. And when, therefore, our spirit is glorified, there will come a day when the body itself will be glorified. You can't put, for example, you put an electric light into a, an alabaster vase, and it will glow. We can see the innocence and divinity sometimes in children. Well, you put divinity into a human nature as it was as was the case with our blessed Lord. His human nature must have glowed as it did at the transfiguration, which must have been a kind of a natural state of our Lord. And so, when we come to the general resurrection, our body is going to be completely transformed, not the same that we have now with all of its imperfections, as the seed is not that which becomes the rose. So our body will be in keeping with the grace that we have received. And my good friends, you've now heard a story, a sermon that you've never heard before on old pots. And may I recommend to you that you allow his fingers to work the clay. Then you'll not spoil his art, and then you'll not spoil your life. And someday you'll no longer be a pot. You will be a main vase. God love you. I don't really have to say that I hope you like that, because I already know you liked it. Want more? You can go to the show notes for this episode at cantankerouscatholic.com and find links to a tremendous number of Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen's CDs. Believe me, in terms of your spiritual formation, these talks are well worth the money you'll invest in them. Some of them are even free. Got a business or an apostolate? Why not consider advertising on the Cantankerous Catholic? I'll give you nine reasons why you should. One, 82.4% of podcast listeners spend more than seven hours per week listening to podcasts. Two, 54% of listeners are more likely to buy something advertised on a podcast because they like and trust the host. Three, podcasts are proven to get more ad results to highly refined targeted audience. The smaller audiences on podcasts buy more than the largest audiences on terrestrial radio or television. Four, our listeners' annual household income is $75,000 or higher. Five, 49% of Americans listen to podcasts monthly. Six, 55% of Americans listen to podcasts. Seven, three out of four listeners listen to learn new things, ideal for advertisers. 8. 82.4% of podcast listeners spend more than 7 hours per week listening to podcasts. 9. Advertising on the Cantankerous Catholic helps support a completely orthodox apostolate poised to help instigate a Catholic revival, and one's coming. Over 81% of our more than 70,000 listeners are right here in America. 
We're listened to in all 50 states and tens of thousands of cities and towns. Advertising on the Cantankerous Catholic costs far less than you might think. I'm not trying to make a living, but only keep this apostle alive, and you'd be helping with that. So reach out to me today at joe at cantankerouscatholic.com, and let's talk about it. It's time for the Sacred Heart Wins with Bishop Joseph Strickland. Each week, His Excellency answers your toughest questions about the Catholic faith, the problems in the church, spiritual questions, catechetical topics, or anything else you want to know. If you have a question, just email it to joe at cantankerouscatholic.com. Now here's Bishop Strickland and Joe Pack, the Every Catholic Guy. Your Excellency, thank you for doing this segment of The Sacred Heart Wins. Thanks, Joe. Glad to do it. Our question for today is from someone named Chuck. Chuck asks, can the USCCB itself return to traditional values? Well, Chuck, um, that's a big question because the USCCB is uh, an organization made up of individual bishops. And I have to say, the spectrum of those individual bishops from one part of the country. And really, one way of looking at the USCCB is to say that in many ways, it reflects the differences between California, Texas, New York, Idaho, all the 50 states. Whether it should or not, because our Catholic faith comes from the, the divine revelation of the Word of God, captured in the catechism, the magisterial documents of the church. So should the faith vary like politics does or attitudes do or from one state to another? Should they is another question. Do they? Yes. I mean, California is much more liberal than where I am in Tyler, Texas. And that does affect how the church is presented and lived. That would be true globally. Um, as well. Certainly, I keep going back to one faith, one Lord, one baptism. We do need the unity that is spoken of a lot, but that unity is only going to materialize in a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. So I would say, yes, the, the approximately 300 bishops that make up the USCCB can and should be more united in Christ, more on the same page doctrinally and catechetically in in every aspect of the church. But we have to acknowledge there is division there, and it's our job always to look to Christ for ourselves to be more united to him. And then as we go up the, the chain, you might say, with the hierarchy of the church from the individual Joe in the pew um, to the, the bishop that is in that diocese, all of us are called to fidelity to Christ. And the more, really, I would say to Chuck, the more we can individually live our fidelity to Christ, the more it's going to encourage and inspire and challenge sometimes priests and bishops to be more faithful as well. Amen. Thank you for that answer, Excellency. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Joe. This is for six-pack warriors who are interested in learning to make money online. Earlier this year, ClickBank made a shocking announcement. In a mere 12 months, a small group of ClickBank users made a total of $25,690,213. But here's where it gets crazier. None of them were online business experts. In fact, before that 12 months, they were just regular ClickBank users who'd never made a dime online. Many of them had day jobs or other commitments and just did ClickBank on the side. But there's one thing they all had in common. All of them used my friend Robbie Blanchard's simple three-step system to succeed. Now, in case you haven't heard of him, Robbie Blanchard is the number one ClickBank affiliate. Due to all the success he's had from promoting ClickBank products for high commission, Robbie's put together a free training where you'll learn the same system he used to have such massive success. 
In this training, Robbie will show you how to make $1,000 a day promoting informative products that people are dying to use, how to use the power of Facebook to find huge pockets of untapped buyers, why making $1,000 a day is actually easy to do and just takes three steps, why you need zero experience to have success with this system. You're not going to want to miss this free training if you're looking to generate $1,000 a day. Click the link in my show notes that says how to make $1,000 a day with ClickBank offers for the free training. I am hard, but I am fair. It's time for the Catholic Boot Camp. With your drill sergeant, Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Learn the Catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before. This boot camp is tough, so there's no political correctness, no spirit of Vatican II, and no namby-pamby platitudes. Drill sergeant Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, will prepare you for spiritual war. Now here's Joe Sixpack. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. These were the words of Christ just before he uttered his last words from the cross. It is finished. Having read them recently caused me to recall two different arguments I have heard from non-Catholics about Jesus on the cross. The first argument comes from those who believe Jesus wasn't at all God, but a mere man. The other comes from mostly Protestant fundamentalists. In the first argument from those who claim Jesus isn't God, they like to say that this was a cry of despair, proving he was but a mere man. That's it. That's their entire explanation on the position that Jesus was only a man. (sighs) Not much of an argument, is it? The second argument for Protestant fundamentalists is a wee bit different. Rather than make the claim against his divinity, it instead asserts Christ's divinity but manages to proclaim a belief the Catholic Church considers heresy. Their assertion is that it was at this moment when Jesus took on the sins of all mankind, wrong assumption number one, and that God the Father had turned his back on God the Son because God can't look upon sin, wrong assumption number two. On the first wrong assumption, it should be noted that Jesus' passion began in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is where he first took on the sins of mankind. Scripture and the church have always taught that it's through his suffering that Jesus redeems us. It's nowhere noted that Jesus ever suffered any sort of physical way until his agony in the garden. Luke 22, 43-44 says, And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling upon the ground. When Jesus began sweating drops of blood, he was suffering from a very rare medical condition called hematohydrosis, which often results in death. There are blood vessels around the sweat glands that are like webs. When a person is under immense stress, the vessels constrict. When the anxiety passes, the blood vessels dilate until they rupture. Then the blood goes into the sweat glands. Since the person with hematohydrosis has been under great stress, the sweat glands are producing sweat which pushes the blood through the pores in the body. Jesus had prayed, and the Father sent an angel to minister to him. So the anxiety had passed, which is why he began sweating blood, and began dying even while in the Garden of Gethsemane. This means that Jesus had already taken on the sins of mankind while in the garden, as the church has always taught. Far from turning his back on the Son when Jesus took on the sins of the world, the Father sent an angel to comfort him and help prepare him for the worst that was yet to come. So if those who make their claims regarding Jesus' outcry from the cross are wrong about him being in despair, why did he say those words that seemed so despairing? He was actually quoting from the 22nd Psalm, 21st Psalm in some translations. 
And to answer those who claim Jesus' words show that he was merely a human, we find that they in no way express despair. This psalm is a messianic psalm that tells the death of the Messiah, so we'll need to give an overview of it as we cover this important aspect of our redemption. Unfortunately, time won't allow as close a look as I'd like to take, but we'll at least cover some high points. The psalmist doesn't imply that Jesus lost the favor of God, but that God had abandoned him to the hatred of his enemies. Christ makes his complaint with a complete trust in God, prays earnestly for deliverance, and ends with joyful words of praise and thanksgiving. Let's look at just a few of the verses of this psalm. Christ's words from the cross are the first verse of Psalm 22. Then verses 6 through 8 tell us, But I am a worm and no man, scorned by men and despised by all the people. All who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He committed his cause to the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Compare this to what Jesus' mockers said at the foot of the cross in Matthew 27, 43. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now. If he desires him, for he said, I am the Son of God. Then we look at verse 14 of the psalm. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, and it is melted within my breast. This could be a reference to what happened to Jesus physically during his death, the evidence of which we see when a soldier pierced his side into his heart and blood flowed out mixed with water. But whether it's a reference to that or not, it most certainly supports findings based on the Shroud of Turin, showing that some of the joints of Jesus' body had been made to pop out a joint. Now let's look at verses 16 through 18 of the psalm. Yea, dogs are round about me, a company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my raiment they cast lots. Now compare this to the crucifixion and John 19 verses 23 and 24. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts, one for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose that shall be. This psalm clearly demonstrates that Jesus was not in despair, which is a mortal sin. And we've also seen that he didn't make his outcry from the cross because the Father had turned his back on Jesus for taking on man's sin. This being the case, then, we have to ask why Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The answer is simple. Jesus had already said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, in Luke 23, 34. He loved them so much, all of us, that from the cross he petitioned the Father for forgiveness. Then he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, to try to get those present, especially the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, to see and understand that he was fulfilling the Messianic prophecy in Psalm 22. In the few moments of his remaining life, Jesus continued to appeal to those who were responsible for hating him and crucifying him to come to him for forgiveness and love. And thanks to Holy Mother Church, who gave us the Bible from the councils of Carthage and Hippo, Jesus continues to draw our attention to that fact today when we read and study the scriptures. Everyone searches the internet to solve problems or fill needs they have. For many of you, I've already done the heavy lifting. Discounting the evil things searched for online, people generally search for things that tell them how to make money online, health and wellness products, and trading and investing. Some are interested in having their own podcast. I've got your back on these things. Visit cantankerouscatholic.com. Go to the episodes page, then click on the title of this episode. Below the podcast player, you'll see my show notes. I've already listed products and services in various groupings. Check them out. 
you can help yourself and this apostolate at the same time because if you like what you see and purchase the products or services, this apostolate will get a small commission. Check out those links today. The Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from Pope St. Pius X. He said, Liberal Catholics are wolves in sheep's clothing. The priest must unveil to the people their perfidious plot, their iniquitous design. You will be called papist, clerical, retrograde, intolerant, but pay no heed to the derision and mockery of the wicked. Have courage. You must never yield, nor is there any need to yield. You must go back into the attack wholeheartedly, not in secret, but in public, not behind barred doors, but in the open, in the view of all. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. In the Old South, a slave named Joe worked on a large plantation for a rich owner. Before the master died, he gave his diamond ring to Joe in appreciation for his years of service. After his master's death, there was nothing for Joe to do, so he left the plantation. All he had was the diamond ring, and he didn't want to sell it. About a year later, Joe was resting near a well at a roadside. The well was deep and muddy. By some accident, he dropped the ring into the well. The poor old man cried pitifully because he couldn't recover the ring. It so happened that a rich plantation owner and his son were driving by. They pulled up and asked Joe why he was crying. He told his whole story. The rich man asked his son whether he'd like to help Joe recover his ring. The young man agreed because he was kind and generous. After changing clothes with the old man so as not to soil his own, he climbed down into the filthy well, reached into the dark mud, and recovered the diamond ring. Joe was overjoyed. He didn't know how to thank the young man who not only gave him the diamond ring but also his suit of clothes. You're like the old slave. The diamond ring is a picture of your soul, the most precious thing you have. You received it from God. You put it in danger of being eternally lost by every mortal sin you commit after baptism. Jesus is the rich man's son. Though he's God's own son, having a divine nature, he put on the clothes of our human nature and became man. He went down into the depths of our suffering and into the filth of our sinfulness in order to save our souls. He let us have his garment of sanctifying grace. Jesus is God and man. He has a divine and human nature. How you should love him for being so generous. This has been The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Thanks for subscribing and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It.